Hi guys, my name is Mark. I'm from Montana, as Ms. Bean just said, and I'm here to talk to you a little bit about uh, grizzly bear recovery in uh, my part of the world. Um, I wonder if I, does this clicker work with the PowerPoint? I didn't even ask that. No, I'll do it myself then. All right, so first things first. So years and years ago, historically, grizzly bears used to roam a good port part of North America. In some cases, they still do, mostly north of us here. You can see their current range goes up here into Alaska, the Northwest Territories, northern Canada. However, historically, they used to go all over North America. There was approximately 100,000 to 200,000 bears um, until, oh, the turn of the 19th century. And as westward expansion happened with people, um, bears weren't looked too nicely upon. So um, the less predators was generally thought the better. They dropped cyanide in the mountains and all over the plains and uh, poisoned a lot of these predators off, mostly for more game. You have less conflicts with things trying to kill your cattle. That was generally what happened. And so you, what you had is currently bears have been extirpated to 2% of their former range in the lower 48 states. And so if you zoom in there, that's our existing condition. Most of you probably know your states and some of these different areas. Uh, one up here, you have the Northern Cascades in Washington. And uh, their population of bears is maybe one or two. They really don't have a lot of bears, but they have a lot of habitat. And so when they set up these recovery areas, that's kind of what they focused on, existing bear populations of grizzly bears, and maybe some big, wild protected areas that they could maybe still have grizzly bear populations in, whether they're there or not. So most of the bears up here in the Northern Cascades are actually going to British Columbia. And every once in a while, a bear wanders down into the Cascades. But they look for them all the time, wondering if the bears are actually there. Uh, number two, we have the Selkirks here in Idaho and a little bit of the Cabinet Yak in Montana. This is a pretty small population, maybe 100 to 200 bears, and in some places little populations of 30 bears. These are pretty small, kind of fragmented populations. So you go down here to Yellowstone, most of you probably know Yellowstone, that's a pretty healthy population. In fact, they just proposed to delist the bear and do it a court case that's still on the Endangered Species Act, but they're looking to delist sometime again in the future. So you have 400 to 600 bears down here, but it's really not connected to anything. It's just kind of an island population down southern border Montana and in Wyoming. And then you have the Bitterroot ecosystem, number four, right here. And the population was one bear, now it is zero. There really haven't been any grizzly bears here. In fact, they proposed to reintroduce bears, but a lot of Western people don't really like predators still. They don't want the wolves in their backyards. They don't want grizzly bears. Not to say that's a general concept, but some people like them, some people don't. So it's very political, as you can imagine, to try to reintroduce a large carnivore, such as a bear there. And so really, you don't have any bears here. Uh, a hunter mistakenly shot a bear. He thought it was a black bear, which is legal to shoot, and it turned out to be a grizzly bear that had moved in from somewhere else. So we're gonna talk about the place that is near and dear to my heart, the Northern Continental Divide ecosystem, the champion among recovery areas because it has the healthiest grizzly bear population. So what I'm gonna to talk today about is recovering that grizzly bear population. A lot of grizzly bear biologists for the last 40 years have worked hard and from the sweat uh, they may are proposing to delist the bear here come in the next year. So I'm gonna take, take you through the science behind that. I'm a wildlife biology geek so I like graphs and data but hopefully you guys will get a lot of pictures and take something away from it too. So if you zoom into this area here, my home is Kalispell right there. We'll zoom into that area to get a better look at things. And you can see we had Glacier National Park up here in the very top part. It's connected to Canada. And then we have the Bob Marshall Wilderness. This is capital W Wilderness. No roads allowed. All trails, rugged mountains, and hard, really, for humans to access that stuff unless they're on a horse or they're hiking a long ways. And this is what grizzly bears, turns out, they need. They need some big tracks of wild, protected areas. And maybe that's why this, re this recovery area has been so successful, is because you have these big chunks of core habitat, areas away from human disturbance that really help the bear recover. Um, you have some other areas. You have a Mission Mountains Wilderness down here, another area of roadless lands. And then around the periphery, you have a lot of human development. You have some multiple resource forest lands and other things like that. Now, most of the audiences I talk to, they tend to be from Montana, or they're familiar with some of the sites I see. So I kind of struggle with getting you guys to picture where I'm talking about, so I brought along some photos. This was flying around last week by Abba Biles in the state. He gave me his picture. And this is Glacier National Park looking across the mountains. And this is a lot of what the interior you're looking at. This is Glacier Park. So you have these big reserves of rock and ice, big mountains, high alpine habitat. You also have along the 
eastern part of the range, the Rocky Mountain Front, you have some sagebrush plains, which bump right up in the mountains. This is dry habitat. There's some aspen in the small pockets, but really, really dry, grassy plains. And again, you have some sprawling forest lands. And this is mostly where I work. I work in the Swan Valley, and I'll point it out to you later. And it's a lot of sprawling forest lands with some big water bodies and some big rivers. And this pretty much sums it up. You can see a lot of the treed forests, some rolling mountain hills. And then finally, let's see if I have another slide. Ah, we have around the whole edge of this ecosystem, we have you know, some developed rural lands. And that's where the people live. And I'll talk about the end of the, the, end of the talk. Um, is how bears end up dealing with people, and that's some of the challenges that I work with in particular. So what you should take away from this, grizzly bears inhabit all these different habitats. So they're a generalist species. They take advantage of a lot of different environments. They don't have just one wooded landscape or one grasslands in the, as a feather in the hat. They take advantage of them all. So what really drives bears, oh, we'll talk about this first. So to kind of get you guys acquainted, I imagine you're familiar with black bears because you all have black bears here in Connecticut. But uh, grizzly bears are a little different. They're much more aggressive, and they're definitely a larger species. So if you look at the differences, they have much longer claws, two to four inches, even six inches with a lot of bigger males. These claws are typically used for digging. They dig a lot. In addition, that big mountain of muscle on the top of their back is also a hump, which is pretty characteristic. They have shorter, rounded ears, dished in profile. And a lot of people come to Montana thinking that grizzly bears are brown, because technically they are brown bears and then black bears are black, but that's not always the case. Color is a very misleading factor when it comes to bears, and you have to be careful when you're identifying. So what you'd usually recommend is using a combination of these characteristics. And I'm gonna guess you guys are pretty familiar with black bears since you have them around here. So if you're looking at an actual grizzly bear, I'll help you guys get to know the bears. The big males will usually run around 800 to 1,000 pounds, but generally they average between 400 to 600 pounds depending on the season and where they're at in the ecosystem. Usually a bear's size has to do a lot with the food resources that it has access to. Females are a little bit smaller, 200 to say 400 pounds on the much larger end. And you can see those characteristics I just pointed out. There's a flat dished in forehead, short rounded ears. Down here you got those long claws for digging up roots and insects and all kinds of grubs. And what is important here, and this has a lot to do with grizzly bear recovery and maybe a reason why they became threatened in the first place, is because grizzly bears are the slowest reproducing mammal in North America. It takes a female almost 10 years to replace herself within an ecosystem. So these animals, when they have a high mortality rate, they don't rebound very quickly. And so you can see this female here has a pretty average litter of about two cubs, and those cubs will stay with her for about two and a half years. And she kicks them loose, finds a new sugar daddy, and begins the process all over again. And some things we're finding out about bears in addition is they like riparian habitats. In addition to all the general habitats they do like, they like water bodies, they like wetlands, places with a lot of emergent grasses and a high diversity of plant species because it means high food resources. Also, they find they like a lot of avalanche soups, these places of high greenness or a lot of deciduous vegetation. They can take advantage of all these places. This is in Glacier National Park, and this is a classic avalanche slope where you'd find a lot of bears. In fact, the state there actually has a trap right about where I'm standing to take this photo, and they were looking to trap for research. So I'll take you through the general season of a bear. This time of year, they're coming out of their dens. Grizzly bears will den for the whole winter. There's not a lot of food for them when there's a bunch of snow on the ground. So they tuck themselves away in a high mountain den, usually above six to 8,000 feet, and uh, they live off their fat for the entire winter. Uh, they don't poop, they don't pee, they just sleep. And it's pretty incredible what they can do physiologically because they breathe about once a minute and their heart beats maybe six to eight times per minute. They really shut their metabolism down. And so um, about a month ago, you have bears start to emerge from their dens. They're getting ready, they're kicking up for their active season. They're gonna put some more fat on their bones and get ready to den all over again. And this is actually a grizzly bear den. This guy, you can see where he blew out the hole, dug himself out from underneath the snow. And uh, a biologist took this just a couple days ago, um, bear making its way down to the low country. And you find bears are highly driven by their stomachs. They have to not only live off that fat um, through the entire winter, but a lot of females depend on that fat reserves to nurse their cubs to the den and into the spring when, food, when foods aren't readily available. So they make their way down to the lowlands to find some grassy vegetation. And we find that a lot of people think of bears, they eat a lot of meat. Well, that's the case in some places. But in the Northern Continental Divide, less than 10% of a bear's diet is meat. They take advantage 
So I'm a biology engineer. I won't give you guys too much and too many graphs. But uh, they eat a lot of insects here. They have grasses and sedges. Uh, huckleberries, berries are a big part of a bear's diet in the ecosystem. And they seem to, seem to be seasonally opportunistic. They like to take advantage of some foods that are always around. So in the spring, when they have a lot of grasses coming up, because that's kind of what spring is, they take advantage of these, this big green here and down here. Um, later in the summer, when berries are actually ripe, you'll find the bears up a little higher and just camped out in some of these bear patches. And you find that there's actually cultures between bears. They take advantage of different food resources because that's what their mother ended up telling them, teaching them to do. And so this will actually show you how much weight a bear will put on. They come out of the dens, and as you can imagine, these are box plots. So the bigger the box plot, obviously, is the more variability or the more how much weight or body fat a bear actually has. And this is sampled through trap bears throughout a season by Montana Fish, Wildlife, and Parks. And you can see that they come out of the den here in five, which is May. And if you're a female, you have you know, about 10% body fat. And what's interesting is they track through the summer. August, they start kind of cramming for their big test. They're cramming to put on enough fat so they can make it through the winter in the den. And so you see this huge variability. That's when they their, their system really amps up and they start putting on a lot of those fat reserves. Males is the same way. I was showing this to a group a while ago, and somebody remarked, they're like, oh, amazing, Mark. The bears actually get fatter as the year goes on? Who would have thought? So when I was talking about bears are they kind of have a culture in some cases. Females will show their cubs what to eat. And so different bears will take advantage of different resources. Kind of classic biology, right? Animals trying to find their way, their little job in the ecosystem. And you see here, this is a, kind of a confusing graph, and I'm not always smart enough to explain it. But what they do is they'll take isotopes from bears' scat and hair. And they look at those isotopes to see what the bear has been eating. So some of those signatures will match up to different foods in the ecosystem. And you find that bears on the eastern Rocky Mountain front, on the eastern side of our ecosystem, they eat a lot more meat up here. So here's your herbivore to carnivore continuum. So the bears on the west side, they tend to specialize more in plant life. They eat a lot over here, which is why, just as you think of a bodybuilder, bears on our eastern side of the mountains, they tend to be bigger, more of the bodybuilder bears. They're like 1,000 pounds. There's a bear in my area. I thought he was a big male. He was like 400 pounds. And he actually crossed the entire ecosystem, about 60 miles, made his way through the mountains. <laughs> And uh, Fish, Wildlife, and Parks manager caught him over on the other side. And he told me, he's like, yeah, that was the smallest adult male I have ever caught. I was all disappointed and felt self-conscious. <laughs> so to recover the species, what do we need? We need to know how many there are. We need to know what the population is doing. Is it rising, falling? Which way is it going? That will give us a start to actually do some conservation for the species. So, Naturally, it's kind of hard to count how many, how many species, uh, bears there actually are. You just wander around in the mountains aimlessly, sending people out on all the trails and trying to count one, two. Was that the same one? I don't know. Uh, so someone actually had a pretty fantastic idea. They took advantage of a natural behavior that bears do. And, and you've probably seen this on the news. The bears rub, and no one really knows why. They love to rub on rub trees all over the place. You walk down a trail, and you'll see this big light spot on a tree, and the bears will come to it. The next bear will come to it. You can even see where they have the similar footprints in the dirt. They stand in the same place, and they rub. And it doesn't really seem that bad, actually. And most likely, some people theorize they do it for be territorial. Bears really aren't that territorial. Some people, they want a scent mark to let females know in the area. Most likely, it just feels good. And that was taken with the remote camera. It's a mo the motion sensor goes off, and you actually can take some video. So I always will talk to people and say, some people ask, you know, this is what it would be like to actually encounter a grizzly bear firsthand. So this bear actually found the camera and decided to come investigate it. Bears have amazing sense of smell. They actually have directional noses, so they'll follow. If you drag a piece of meat along the ground, they'll follow the same direction you drug the piece of meat. When uh, a biologist from Fish, Wildlife, and Parks who studied bears his whole life explained to me one time that they'll actually follow the, all the exothelial skin cells we drop on the ground. When we're walking around, a bear will follow that around some of the trap sites, exploring where we walked, because that's how good their sense of smell is. So this guy, you can imagine, the camera smells like human beings. He's kind of like, what's going on? And so he decided to come check it out. You got, yeah, they flew me all the way out here, and I show you cinematography like this, right? It's 
see if it goes away. All right, so. <laughs> Who would have thought the video was that long? There we go. We're on time, 16. So, what do I mean by all this hair and rubbing? There's my video. There's the next one. Well, someone had the brilliant idea that we can kind of go all CSI with these bears. The technology exists where you can actually take bear hair from these rub trees and you can use DNA and you can get individual genotypes for all the different bears. And with a statistical method called Mark Recapture, the USGS, who are a lot smarter than I am, ended up generating, well, we've caught this many bears, and the next season we caught this many of the same bears. And using that method, you can generate an estimate of how many bears might be out there by how many bears you recapture through their DNA genotypes. So you actually put people on the ground. They hiked all these trails through the mountains. They checked all these barbed wire posts they put on known bear rub trees, and they collected bear DNA. So as of 2004, they uncovered there's like twice as many grizzly bears in this population that uh, we thought we had before. 765 bears was their estimate. And this is thought of as maybe the most precise wildlife population estimate ever done. So it's pretty cool stuff. Kate Kendall and the USGS spearheaded this. And what's interesting about this is you can see that Grizzly Mon Glacier Park, each of these color-coded dots kind of represents an individual subpopulation or kind of interbreeding bears that they mate within their local area. So you can see that you know, bears within Glacier Park here, they kind of go all the way over here to the North Fork of the Flathead River. This green population, they kind of stick to the eastern northern Rockies for Montana. This bear on the front, they take advantage more of the plains down here and they work themselves that around. Southern bears are down here. And she also finds that Glacier Park has the lion's share of bears, about 500 or so. And the population of bears gets less dense as you go down south throughout the ecosystem. I work here in the Swan Valley. And we have kind of a medium density population of bears. And you can see, kind of see the swan sticks themselves. They don't like a lot of other bears. So we have a great, po we have a great population estimate. Like I said, maybe the most accurate in the world. We know there are 765 bears as of 2004. Are we done? No, not quite. We need to know what the population's doing. Is it rising, falling, staying the same? And so what you do is you generate an estimate of population trend. And so Montana Fish, Wildlife, and Parks, in cooperation with some partners, ended up collaring a bunch of females and following them around to see how many little cubs they have. When I say collaring, I mean a radio collar, a radio device that you can actually track. It emits a radio signal like radio stations all around the country do. And you tune it in with a receiver like you have in your car. And you can able, with an antenna, follow that signal around. So that's why you can keep track of all these females and see how many cubs they're having. You can keep track of little cubs of the year like this one, or even a yearling bear like this one taken up here at Granite Park in Glacier Park. And there's a picture of a radio collar and a fancy dancy radio telemetry device. Now you guys see on a lot of TV shows they have like holographic images or you see like cell phones you know, on a map. <laughs> Unfortunately, wildlife science is, has advanced a long ways, but we're still listening to radio signals, which is basically a series of beeps. And, uh, I've taken people out that are all excited to track grizzly bears and they're bored in like the first five minutes. So you have to appreciate the science maybe, I don't know. So the next hard, the hardest part is getting the collar on the bear, which you can imagine a grizzly bear is a very aggressive animal, very large, very protective of her cubs. It can be very challenging. And they've developed a system of methods, these guys have been doing it for years and years and years, of actually trapping. They'll use drugs to sedate the bear and then take some data on the bear itself, body weight, blood, Etc. cetera, and uh, then they fit it for a radio collar and then follow it around for the next, oh, two years. So different ways to do this is using a culvert trap. It's a big steel barrel with a door that comes down, like basically a trap door. You put a hunk of deer meat at the end, these bears smell it from forever away, and uh, comes wandering in. Yanks in the deer and then pulls it down. Now this is an interesting picture. You guys probably thought I just put a bunch of trees there, but there's actually a biologist on the eastern part of the ecosystem who sits in a tree with a tranquilizer gun. And he has a big dead cow beneath him. And uh, he shoots the bears with a tranquilizer gun. And it's on that tranquilizer gun is a spool of fishing line. And now keep in mind, usually bears are active in the early dawn and evening. So he shoots these bears and they run off and they go to sleep. However, you, always, you don't never know how much drug the bears have gotten. So sometimes they're not all the way asleep or they're still kind of being they're a little anesthetized, but they're kind of rolling around. So what he does is he gets out of the tree after shooting the bear. He waits about 20 minutes, and then he follows the string to see where the bear went. 
hoping that when he gets to the end of the string, the bear will be asleep. <laughs> Probably the most popular way uh, to catch bears is snaring. And um, mostly Fish Walking Parks does that within Montana. Their responsibility is to manage the wildlife. And you can see here, this is a bear in a snare kind of around the tree. And this is kind of the way it's done. There's a little cubby you build. So the bear generally will take the path of least resistance. The bear could knock over that stuff, no problem. But they're, not, they're kind of unassuming. They're the biggest, toughest kids on the block. They're used to pushing all the other animals around. And you have a hunk of deer meat here in the back. And they walk into it, and it's just exactly what you think, kind of Swiss Family Robinson style. Uh, there's a snare and a loop in the ground, and the bear gets caught. And then your biologists come to check that snare, like Lori Roberts of Fish, Wildlife, and Parks is doing, and she tranquilizes the bear. Now, you can imagine a snared bear is not always you know, the most easygoing of animals. So they're very careful with what they do. You can see this bear is kind of tangled up against the tree with part of the cubby there, and uh, so she tranquilizes it. it. Takes about 15 minutes, these bears go to sleep. What I think is amazing is these biologists take fantastic care of the bear. And I've helped out with this a little bit. But they give the bear oxygen. They treat it for any wounds. Like I said before, they fit it with the radio collar. Um, here, they're actually shaving um, for the bear's femoral arteries so they can take blood. Um, they can look at some different things, such as fat content and isotopes through the blood. Um, and they've even developed reversal drugs, so drugs that you can give it to help cycle the drugs out of the bear's body. The bear can wake up, it's mobile, it's able to protect itself, take advantage, protect its cubs, that kind of thing. Additionally, they also put it on, they give it an IV out there in the field, help us cycle through those drugs out of its system a little bit more. You want that bear to be up and ready to go as soon as it can. So now you have a collar on this bear. You can follow it around, use your fancy dancy wildlife telemetry, and uh, most of the times, these bears move long distances, sometimes 60 miles at a time. So you want to be able to follow this thing around. And uh, usually that's done by plane. You get up there in a plane with some antennas and you fly around over the Bob Marshall or over Glacier Park, trying to pick up where he's going. And what you want to do is you want to see him, see how many cubs. Or you, you can hire Eric Peterson, who works in Glacier National Park, and he gets to run around the mountains with an antenna. Kind of sounds like a fun job, huh? He always calls me when he's out doing this when I'm stuck in the office and rubs it in. It's not very nice. So what you're doing is you're looking for little guys like this, Cubs of the Year, seeing if they make it through to the next season. But you're also trying to pay attention to how many of these bears will die. Um, you want to know how many dies, right? Be die because to get a population trend, you have births minus deaths is going to give you a positive, negative, or a zero number, right? And that'll give you what your population is doing, a trend. This bear is a 500-pound grizzly that was hit down um, in the southern part of the ecosystem. A big truck was motoring along early in the morning, and this bear ran out. Again, you can see how long those claws are. Um, if you ever want to see him, if you're moving through Lincoln, Montana, you stop into the school or the ranger station, actually, and he's mounted there. So what does what is mortality done in the, in the ecosystem? I mentioned that big protected areas are good for bears. Well, we can see that throughout time, since 1987 through 2010, um, there's been a lot of bears die. And typically, this has increased. But is that proportional to what the population is doing? If the population is also increasing, you'd expect mortality to go up too, right? Still 10% of whatever number you have. Um, and you also see that it's up and down. Bears, like I pointed out, they're like the Homer Simpsons of food. They are driven by their stomachs. So on bad natural food years, you have a lot of bears coming out of the mountains, or a lot of bears that are used to eating natural foods around people, and they're a little more desperate. They want a little more fat to build up, and they'll take easy meals around people. And that's usually a bad thing. And I'll talk about that more here in a little while. So you can see over the last 10 years, this is what I mentioned, Typically, when bears come around people, um, it becomes a safety issue. And uh, sometimes human foods are kind of like drugs for bears. They do it once. They realize it's a bad idea, but they're going to do it. And then they don't do it again for a while. The next time time get tough, they're hungry, they'll do it again. And then they'll do it again. And eventually, they become what's called food condition. They become dependent on food, human foods because it's, like, I mean, it's like fast food for them. They're used to chasing baby deer around or climbing steep mountains looking for different foods. So if they can just knock over a garbage can and eat, it's pretty easy. They're going to take it. And you can see that these management removals, when a bear gets too close to people, it's oftentimes trapped, relocated. But if it keeps, if it's a repeat offender, then oftentimes they'll have to euthanize the bear. And that is the leading cause of bear mortality within the ecosystem. And this is true for a lot of bear populations. Um, additionally, trains will actually kill a lot of bears. Um, illegal kills. Uh, bears aren't always, they influence a lot of man, land management projects. Um, Bears are sensitive to road densities, timber harvest, and stuff like that. So people don't always, they kind of resent the fact that bears are protected. Um, and so you have some illegal killings. Um, mistaken ID, bears that are thought to be black bears, like I said before, and they are shot. But it turns out to be a grizzly in the end. 
um, trapping. Sometimes to research these bears when they're trapping, they do lose a few, very, very irregularly. Self-defense, occasionally you have hikers walking through or hunters and they end up tripping over a bear, um, jumping out of the brush. And um, they, like I said before, grizzly bears are very aggressive and especially females with cubs and so the bears end up being shot in self-defense. Uh, automobile, like I just showed you, and then unknown, sometimes there's a dead bear and you get to it and it's just turned into a puddle of goo and you don't know what killed it. So you gotta put that in the graph. So this is, goes more to my point that large, big protected areas help people. Bears are sensitive to human development. They're sensitive to humans. Like I showed you before, management is the leading problem with mortality. And uh, so what this shows you is, if you look at all last year's deaths of grizzly bears, really in this big undeveloped wilderness area, you have one natural death. Glacier Park, only on the edges where all that human development is, is where you end up getting uh, bears that die. So, from kind of from a conservation angle, that's an important thing to remember. So what's the population doing? We, results just came out last year. Population's growing at 3%. Kind of hooray. So now we have a good population size. We know the bears are growing. And with a couple other considerations, habitat, habitat management, um, we can start to move the bears to delist. This is just a graph showing the number of females in the ecosystem. And what's kind of cool is back in when they first started this, I think it's 87, um, they guessed that bears were about 193. And so they took, you know, later on, 20 years later, they look at the data, and their guess was actually pretty right. They, they used the data backwards, and they kind of figured out, and it's, they were pretty close, you know. And uh, methods have come a long way, so it's pretty cool that 20 years ago, methods were still very good. So what else comes from some of these collars we put on bears? Well, in the southern part of the Swan Valley, right here is where I work, I'll show you, um, you have mountain ranges, you have a valley, and a wilderness area. So these green dots are actually, these are GPS points that come from a radio collar, and they're great because they can tell you what kind of habitats a bear uses. And so going forward, we're gonna need to know, um, in addition to what bears, have, bears use, but it could also be informative as to human conflicts. And that's really gonna be the future of what drives um, conservation of grizzly bears, is how to manage all those human conflicts with grizzly bears. And that's what I work with specifically. So you look at this data and you're kinda like, okay, here's a mountain range here, this is a satellite image. Here's a mountain range here. You know, this bear is just doing what bears do. Looks like pretty good habitat, fairly undeveloped. When you zoom in on one of the areas down here in Sealy Lake, which is probably about the size of New Milford here, you see the bear was actually right in town. Like I said before, walking along the creek system, and uh, which is pretty interesting because then you find out that while he's walking around town, things like this are happening. The female's in there with a the cub. She's maybe a little stressed because she's trying to get food or maybe she's not but she smells all these odors from garbages or foods cooked in your kitchen, and they get tempted, like I said before. And in some cases, bears can become pretty desperate for food, like this black bear here, who's pulling a high wire act just to get some bird seed. And he ends up being able to pull it off and grab onto it. <laughs> but once bears get that food reward, that's where it comes from the adage that a fed bear is a dead bear. They, uh, they realize it's a food source, and even when times get tough later on, they're kind of like, well, I think I can go back to that. And this cartoon kind of sums it up. You know, I know I shouldn't do it. Those people are scary, and, but I'm gonna have the garbage. Mm -hmm. And that's what they do in some cases. They tip garbages over. So I work with a lot of people trying to get bear-proof garbage cans, dumpsters, electric fencing around certain beehives, or you know, even calving areas for cattle. That kind of stuff is important because you wanna keep that separation between people and bears. And eventually bears can become so what's called habituated, so they're not, they're not afraid of people. They become used to a neutral stimulus. They don't run, they're not scared, and so they get brave enough that they'll actually come in and break into a home and get into refrigerators and stuff, which you can imagine is a bad thing. Um, this bear actually, he developed a sight, a sight image. So he knew, because he'd broken into a couple of houses before, that these white boxes held a lot of food. And you'd actually go to some of the cabins in the swan and he would see his nose prints and paw prints on the wall, and he actually had hair too, so that's how I know it's him, because he could pull the hair and see DNA. But he couldn't see the fridge from the window, so he wouldn't go in that cabin. But next door, he could see the fridge, and you'd see him break down the door, and he'd push the fridge over, get into the cabin. So they're not very nice when they break into your house to eat. And unfortunately, he wouldn't go back out the door, he'd usually go out a window or something like that. So he caused a lot of damage. Um, like I said before, um, that bear was, ended up being captured. He was relocated, but after that, didn't quit his old ways, and ended up being euthanized. 
So what do they do with some of these bears that have been <coughs> captured for management reasons? They're too close to people. They're breaking into some of the stuff. They need to be, they need to be moved. So well, this bear um, is named Samantha's male. And Samantha's male, I was kind of pulling for Samantha's male, because um, he, he was really good at getting the chicken's coops. And I was kind of hoping he'd become this notorious bear throughout the ecosystem, but he was terrible at catching chickens. He'd break into a coop, oh, I don't know, about the size of that podium, which had like, you know, say 20 chickens in it, and he'd be able to kill like three. It was terrible, <laughs> but good in the same way. <laughs> um, so what you see here is this, this is another culvert trap here. Those bears are typically trapped, and they're moved someplace a long ways from people. And uh, the idea being that you can get these bears away from human development, kind of reestablish them in a, an environment where they can use natural foods. But a lot of times what you find is these bears will travel maybe 40 air miles, 60 air miles in a couple days, and come back to the same area and get back into trouble. Maybe not the next couple days, but also you know, the next year if they're food stressed, sometimes they do it again. And what they'll do sometimes when they do release these bears is give them the most miserable experience of their lives. It's called a hard release or aversive conditioning. And you can see this bear, they open the trap up and he's running, he's got a radio collar on. And this is uh, Derek and Heather Reich here, and he's actually shooting it with bean bags and rubber slugs. And you can imagine being trapped as a bear is kind of like being captured by aliens, right? So you're, you, you're scared and you want to imprint that on the bear. You want to show them that's a negative stimulus, don't come around people again. And they end up getting shot with rubber slugs and bean bags and, and that's pretty scary. And that should imprint, leave that impression of people. Don't go around them, leave them alone. So that really is the legacy of bears into the future. Um, we have a great recovering population, a hard work by a lot of different agencies and hard fought biologists. And um, what's gonna go forward is uh, really managing people and bears and how that little balancing act is gonna shift. I ended a little early. I think we finished at 1040, yep. So um, if there are any questions, I'll do my best to either avoid them or answer them depending on what you guys think. Yes, back here. Sure. Yeah. Do, they, do they thrive in that type of environment more than they do in other types of environments? I mean, are they healthier where there's a river system? That's a great question. Um, really, in Alaska, a lot of brown bears will definitely eat fish. In fact, that's why you actually have a Kodiak brown bear, which is a much larger version. Their bears are greater than 1,000 pounds. They have this high protein source. And absolutely, it's a great food resource. They have all these salmons running the rivers. The bears can just stand in the river, flip the fish out, or catch them in their mouth. Um, sometimes the bears are so full, but they're used to eating, they'll just eat the salmon eggs and leave the rest of the fish on the shore. So they absolutely do thrive. Um, not to say they don't still have problems with bears in Alaska, but they certainly do. Um, bears typically don't eat, or at least brown bears, and black bears for that matter, don't eat fish in my part of the world. Um, they'll eat some cutthroat trout in Yellowstone, but fish is not really a food resource in, uh, in Montana. It's a good question though. Anybody else? All right, well, I have a video if you guys want to see it. And uh, I talked about a hard release. And this is a video up in the North Fork of the Flathead. And I was, I was the guy shooting the bean bags there. And this is typically a state job, but they let me come along and give it a shot. I work for the Forest Service, which is not state-centered. And you'll see these are bears that were drugged earlier. And they're coming out of a trap. And there's all these people in cars behind us. Like we said before, we want to make this a miserable experience for these bears. And so you can see they're kind of loath to come out. The door on the trap's going up right there. And you're going to hear honking and people yelling. These are younger grizzly bears. You don't do this with adult males because sometimes they'll turn and attack, <laughs> which is not what you want. Now keep in mind these bears are a little, they're a little loopy still. You can imagine coming out of surgery, you come out of anesthesia and sedative still wearing off. And they're young, they're like three years old. And they were caught eating a deer carcass near these people's house. And uh, that one does pretty well. That was the one that was worked first. And you hear the explosions in the background, those are what's called cracker shells. You shoot the shell out of a shotgun that goes up in the air and it explodes. You know, sound, generate, they want to generate some fright in the bear. So you can see that this bear probably is thinking he wants desperately to get away. At the same time, he's terrified. And you can kind of hear people in the background going, oh. You hear that's Tim Manley in the background. He's the management specialist. So he specializes with trapping these bears around people. And there it goes.
And like I said before, he's a little loopy, so he's not the most coordinated bear in the world. So that's your typical hard release. Let's see, I'll click on this. And I guess the last thing I'll end with is, what's kind of cool about a growing population is we have bears now that are ending up in places they haven't been for hundreds of years. Um, bears out here in eastern Montana on the plains, there was a bear that wandered out almost 200 miles from a population where the rest of the bears are, he's just going to explore. And this is happening on all different sides of the ecosystem. Um, Kalispell, typically bears aren't found in this area, but they're finding that there are more and more. And the uh, general idea is you want some connectivity of habitat between these different recovery areas. That second slide I showed you with the cabinets and Yellowstone, and maybe someday we'll get there. You have a growing population um, of bears that are moving out of these protected habitats into the periphery, and maybe someday this is Yellowstone down here, maybe someday they'll all be connected. However, keep in mind that a lot of human development exists outside in these areas, you know, towns and roads and highways. So there may be more conflicts to come. Um, I guess that's kind of all I have for you guys. You got a question? Uh, I, saw, I saw a video on YouTube mm -hmm. of a guy that has like a pet bear and he like raised him from a cub. And he like he like wrestles with it and like rides on it, like lets him in the house on his birthday and lets him eat like cake. Like is that like like can you do that with most bears? Like, That's a good question. The question was you see some people on uh, whether YouTube or Bart the Bear is a good example. Bears that have human owners and they're kind of treated like domestic animals, bears that have been raised as cubs, um, and they get to know that person. And to answer your question, um, you can do it, but it's a pretty arduous process. Um, Usually the circumstances are incredibly unique. And um, what, the only thing that frightens with me, I love watching those videos, and you know, it's pretty cool to think about having a pet bear that you could wrestle around with. I would, I would love it. However, they're still wild animals. And uh, you have a great amount of the population out there that doesn't really know what it's like to interact with bears. And so you kind of, in some ways, you're teaching them that that's OK. This is a wild animal, and you can domesticate them. They're just like a dog. And so in some cases, you have people in Glacier Park who have like honey on spoons and they're putting them out there by the edge of the road and trying to take pictures of these bears coming in, thinking that nothing's ever going to happen. In fact, in the 1960s, before um, bears you know, really were thought of as, they were still thought of as dangerous, but there hadn't been a lot of maulings. Um, in some cases, people would try to put their kids out there by the bear and they'd back up and then take a photo. Um, <laughs> see, so you guys are pretty savvy. You know that's a bad idea, right? Um, so that, that worries me, that kind of media impression that these aren't, these aren't wild animals. But now I'm a wildlife biologist, so that's kind of where I come from. It's a good question. I think, all right. Thank you, guys.